Aside from the response, and you alluded to, to articles, uh, Musser, what, what are the um, writings of the Lifrakim and the Mechkarim Batalmud that Rabbi Weinberg wrote? And are those studied widely today? Mechkarim Batalmud is a volume within. Go through the four volumes, they, they're organized. Lifrakim was not a Talmudic work. It was published uh, around 1936 in Germany. Uh, the truth is the one piece of writing that I did in the Weinberg was on Lifrakim, uh, the practice in Hildesheimer, at least during the Weinberg's time, was that at the beginning of the term, he would give a general lecture, which would not be technically Talmudic, it would be more general. One of those lectures was about how academic Talmud, or what you would call philology, would relate to Yeshiva Talmud, which he called Pilpul and why both of them are necessary, and why a student in Hildesheimer does not have to feel inferior, because in addition to doing pilpul, doing yeshiva learning at the highest level, we also are aware that the Talmud is an ancient book, and like other ancient books, it requires a certain kind of historical treatment. So I translated that into English, and uh, published in tradition. There is a German version which Mark Shapiro turned up in a newspaper, the newspaper outside of Germany, I believe, where they reported that Weinberg gave the inaugural lecture and they, uh, they presented a version. The uh, Fakim also contained discussions about God that I might consider more sermonic. Uh, the passage that I had forgotten about, but when I went through Mark Shapiro's book again, in honor of my being with you, uh, Shapiro mentions a lecture in Lutrakim in which the Weinberg excoriates in the strongest possible language the philosophical or scientific value of racial theory. And I remember the passage more or less, I didn't remember the context And Shapiro says, you know, no matter how much that Weinberg wants to live in peace with the German government. And there were people in that world who hoped that Hitler would be, in a, you know, be like the czar, they can, you know, garden variety anti Semite. Mm -hmm. I recall as a child, I heard people telling me that some German Jews in the, third, in the early 30s said, you know, when you cook soup, it's very hot. But when it reaches the table, you let it cool off a little bit. So there were attempts to communicate with it, to tell them, you know, we have a lot in common. You're, you're against communism. You're against Bolshevism. Don't you know that traditional religion is the greatest bulwark against communism? Uh, you know, I don't think it cut very much uh, mustard with Hitler, but assuming that he read it, got to him. So uh, there, uh, it's still when it came to discussing Jewish theology, discussing truth, apparently he was willing to say some very sharp things in a full awareness that 
it's conceivable that the government, the government did have censorship, that they did have, and Lefrakim did have to go through somebody in the government who read Hebrew and uh, uh, that is, I think, uh, why he published those pieces there and I, maybe the, from an educational point of view, having books out there, having things that German Jews could read, that those who read Hebrew could read, was important. Uh, there was a lot of Jewish scholarship in Nazi Germany. And people who uh, uh, did their best to give teach adult education, people like uh, Martin Buber, who really waited until the last possible minute to leave, either because he felt responsibility for German jewelry, and or because his spoken Hebrew was not that good at that point, and he didn't know whether uh, where he would fit at Hebrew was not clear. It was a problem in getting him to Hebrew. Uh, people like, like Heschel may not have a choice. They, they were uh, in several years where they were, uh, they were teaching adult education. Where they, uh, again, eventually Heschel was able to get out to England and from England to the United States. So there was a lot of activity at that point, uh, generally, uh, Modi Rabi or Wurzberger, who was a student in Alzheimer, had walked the streets of Berlin the day after Kristallnacht, was afraid to go back to the dormitory, he didn't know what was going on there. Uh, he said to me, you know, if not for the destruction, German orthodoxy was poised to take off and to do some very interesting things. If they had, uh, you know, if they had been active, a lot of the people who emigrated might have uh, ended up making their careers there. <laughs>